you're stuck with this, you have to go to So buckle up. Yeah. Get used to it. Be pretty slobbery. I figure that's what that is.
Father, we just thank you again for another Sabbath day that you brought us to. We thank you so much for this holy day, this day of revival, to renew us afresh again for the week ahead. Father, we just, we just come together today in a holy convocation just with a, just with a song of praise and a spirit of thankfulness. We have so much to be grateful for, Lord, for our forgiveness, for our sanctification, but we thank you for the work that you've given us to do. That is such a grand calling. It's, it is such a blessing for you to somehow see in us something to call, something to choose out of the world, to take us out and to set us apart. Lord, we just thank you so much for this calling. We thank you for your patience with us through it. We just have so much to be grateful. Our cup really does run it over. So we just come together, Lord. We want to lift Jesus up. We want, we want to make you happy and make you glad. We want you to be blessed that Jesus would be raised up. So we just ask your anointing. We can't, we can't really do anything good without you. We need your spirit. We need you even to praise you because we are nothing apart from you, Lord. We're just, we just say thank you and, and we ask you to anoint these, this day and these services that, you would, that your spirit would be poured out, Lord. We ask that you would ensure that there's nothing but gratefulness in our heart today, that our heart is not shaken, that, that we have a heart that's just thankful, because if it's thankful and it's only thankful, then no worry or concern or fear or anything else can come through. Everything else falls away. Everything else is waiting for us outside this day, Lord. So we just, we ask that you would be here, that you would be blessed, that you would have your way in us and through us to bless our fellowship and everything on this day, all for your glory. So we ask this, Lord, the direction, the services, in Jesus' name, amen. Page number 14. And 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, our enemy is really cunning, but that shouldn't let us be fearful of him. In fact, the title of this, if you need a title, is Let Our Lord's Enemies Fear Us. But let's be mindful also of something that the Lord told his disciples when they were bragging about being able to cast out demons. He said, don't brag that you have this power, but brag that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I've seen in prior times ministers talk about putting the enemy to flee, but they kind of get blasphemous as if it were to kind of boasting in themselves to the point that we can just ridicule and, and berate the enemy and that works. We notice that the highest angel next to Lucifer before he fell would not bring a railing accusation against the enemy. He just simply said, the Lord rebuke you. The only one that has that power is the Lord Jesus. But we're more than conquerors through the Lord, which strengthens us. If you've noticed throughout Scripture, especially the Old Testament, our forerunners of the faith, the ones that fell weak, the ones that stumbled, they didn't just automatically go from strong in the Lord to boom, they fell. The enemy wouldn't just confront them right up. He tried it with David when he was a young man, man with the bear and the lion and then Goliath. And each time he just smote him down. He got to where he realized that that's not going to work. The same way if you notice what he did with the Lord and with Moses, he tried to take him out at infancy. Didn't want to face him when he was full in armor. Didn't want to wait until he was prepared. I think of Samson for one. Now, not saying we should emanate his character when he was the judge, because some of the things he did was you know, questionable. But while he still had the protection and the strength of the Lord, his enemies got to where they didn't want to see him. I mean, he slew a thousand men with a, a bone. Just, you know, a whole army. It wasn't just like farmers and stuff. It was an army of the enemy sent to get him. And he killed them all with a bone. One of us can put a thousand to flight. Two of us can put ten thousand to flight. I've always read in the New Testament where the son, seven sons of Sceva came up and said, we're going to cast you out. And the enemy through the, the ones they were trying to cast the demons out of said, Paul, I know. Peter, I know. But who are you? We don't know who you are. And then they attacked them and made them flee naked. I always wanted to be one where the enemy knew me. Not because of something I did, but because of the Lord in me. Because when you go through being attacked just day in and day out, feeling helpless, feeling bullied, to know that there's someone that can stop it. Now, I may be suppressed, I may be bullied in this earth, on this flesh, but there's someone that can right it all, and that's Jesus. And I don't have to fear if I'm in His favor. I don't have to fear the least little, none of us do. In Jeremiah 1, 5, we won't turn there, but He tells Jeremiah that before he was in the womb, he knew him. And before he was born, he chose him. In Ephesians 1 and 4, it says, The Father chose us in Him, the Lord, before the foundation of the world. And that He accounted us as His sons. Now, we weren't even in His favor at that time. He knew that we were going to sin, that we were going to be the reason His beloved Son was going to go to the cross. But that's how much love He had for us. He chose us and predestined us to be His children, to reign with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But we can't just willy-nilly go about our days and expect it to come, up, come forth. If we're naive, if we're weak in the Spirit, we're going to be conquered. It's just you can't... That old Indian proverb when the young kid saw the two wolves fighting, and he said, looked at his elder and he said, which of the two wolves are going to win. He said, it's the one you feed. The one you strengthen. The one you build up. We're no match for the enemy nor his demons in our own self. Not, not going to happen. No, no way chance in, in this earth. But if we're submitted to God, because that's the Scripture that a lot of people leave the first part out, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. 
He has no choice. Doesn't mean he's going to stop. He's going to stop the frontal assault because he don't like getting his tail kicked either. When he went to Jesus before he started his ministry, he waited until the end of fasting when he was weak in physical flesh to tempt him. He didn't go to him before, at the beginning of it. And even in that point, because our Lord was so submissive to the Heavenly Father and, and loved Him and was in His will, He still conquered Him with no question. In fact, the enemy fled and didn't want to touch Him until later on at the end of His reign. We can be that way on this earth doesn't mean everything's going to go our way. If you think there's a bed of roses that we're all just going to walk into the hell, through hellfire and not smell of smoke when we're retrieving those that are in bondage by the enemy, that's not going to happen. We will smell smoke, but we'll come through the other side victorious. We won't be consumed by it. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power, love, and discipline, or sound mind. He conquers us by letting us hold on to our weaknesses in the flesh. He gets, plants the thought in our mind, condemns us, causes us to bear shame to where we stop doing the things we need to do, spending time in Him, spending time with Him, praising Him, raising Him high, putting Him on the throne. When He can distract us off the mission, he did, he did just like he, he'll do us, like he did with David the king. Took someone so valiant, kind of like Joseph, who wasn't, there was no guile found in him. And we don't see the storyline here, 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 and here with David. But we know he got off to the point that he carried the cart like the heathens, and he, God struck out. Then we also see him sinning with Bathsheba, then trying to cover it up, then killing a man to cover it up. And, it, and then. God forgave him, but it didn't stop the fact that he allowed himself to be distracted from the mission to the point that he fell that week. That's a mighty man of God. That he was, that the devil was able to trip up. Remember Balaam. The king came to Balaam and said, I want to attack these people. And Balaam told him, you can't. They're under the protection of the Almighty God. You're not going to conquer them. What you have to do is you've got to subvert them. You got to get them to step out from under the protection of the Heavenly Father. If they step out and rebel against Him, He will pull back His protection. Then you can have your way with them. That's exactly what Balaam advised him. That's what he did. And that's what they did. And the enemy was victorious that day. He wants to subvert us. Now, if we're weak enough, He can attack us frontal. And we won't have the power to stand. But if we're strong in the Lord, no matter what our position at that moment is, He can't do a frontal assault. He's got to slip in behind. He's got to trip us up. He's got to get us distracted off the mission. How many people has drove down the road and then caught something caught their eye and they looked over at it and then realized that while they're looking, their steering wheel goes with them and you almost have a wreck or go off the road or something. That's how easy it is. Our eyes point to the target. It's innately in our physical DNA as well as our spiritual. If we're focused on something, everything else doesn't matter. That, that task at hand has got our full undivided attention. It's going to be hard for whatever that is, if it be an animal or whatever it is, to attack us and us not be you know, prepared for it. But now if we're just looking over here and something comes from, that, that's the way the enemy works. Let's turn over to wrap this up because we have another part, uh, Brother Donnie. Ephesians 6. You know, those that exercise and have, have weight trained or do weight train or whatever it may be, study for a particular job. Y'all know this to be true. You're given test. If you pass that, if you flunk that test, that doesn't mean you should give up. It's to let you know you're missing something. If you're lifting iron and you're trying to get to a certain weight level, you can't just expect to go from nothing and throw that iron up and be like, ah, look at me. You're going to fail a bunch of times. I remember they 
was talking about like Michael Phelps being, you know, one of the greatest Olympians. The stuff that like athletes like that have to do from their youth, the stuff they have to put to the side, their pleasures they would like to do that would interfere in the goal they want, they basically torture themselves to death to receive that goal. I don't know how many years Michael Phelps tortured himself to be that astute in what he was doing that he could have the most gold medal or the most Olympic medals, period, as of now, currently. People attain that sort of thing all the time when they're driven to a certain point. Let us not be mindlessly aiming around, swinging at the air as Paul said, but let us aim carefully at the mark. And remember that in Revelations, he says, be strong for Satan roams around seeking whom he may devour. Not whom everybody he's going to devour. It says whom he may devour. We can be in a place where he can devour us. And it doesn't take a whole lot. We could be in the place that he beats his head against a stone wall and it basically knocks all of his teeth out and he won't attack us frontally. He tries to slip us up. We want to be that way where it takes an effort, concerted effort from the side to get us off course. Ephesians 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places, something that's been helping me of late. It's hard to focus on it when you're in that moment, but when someone's rising up and trying to tempt you or lead you astray, or you think, oh, well, they're just want me to hang out with them or whatever, whatever the case may be, don't view that as a person. Because if they're leading you out outside the will of God, that's the enemy behind that person trying to say, come on, come over here. Fudge a little bit. Just come on. Do it. And then one, one, you also take your witness to that person and whoever's around that sees it. Because they say, well, I remember yesterday you did such and such. And now you're going to tell me I can't do that? Quit looking at the physical so much. I have to remind myself that every day because that's immediately I want to get mad and want to, my flesh wants to do things to the people that are behind the scene, you know, the little puppet out there when I should be focused on the puppet master behind them. Therefore, verse 13, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist the evil in the day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having your, girded your loins with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's a very key, well, all of it's important, but 15 there, basically put your shoes on to do the God's work. Prepare yourself every day, be shod, ready to go into the Lord's work. Not be concerned about, oh, I got to make money today. I got to go to work today. I got to go grocery shopping today. But foremost in your mind, looking for opportunities to share, like Pastor said and Witt said, you know, looking for the opportunity. If somebody says, oh, happy holidays or whatever, look at the opportunity. I don't have to just come down on them, but just throw out a nugget. If they seem interested or don't shun you, then throw out more nuggets. Don't be so wrapped up in what you're doing that you're just like, well, okay, I ain't got time for that. I'm not going to say anything. We're the workmen. We're very few in this world, and we're not the only ones. But the harvest is great. The only way a few people are going to do a big job is if they do it efficiently and keep focused. Verse 14. Uh, verse, uh, sorry. Verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. The Lord's sacrifice for us should be enough. Not to count all the other things we can see in our life where He stepped in and intervened here. He kept me from making that decision. He protected me when I was attacked there. Just the fact that He's willing to make us part of His family should be enough to give us faith to say, the enemy can't touch us unless we step out from under that covenant. 
covering. Balaam knew it. Balaam knew it. You can't touch them as long as they're in God's will. Verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, our military boards, I believe it was in World War II, were feared not because they had superior firepower, but because of their hand-to-hand -hand combat with the bayonet. Some of the enemies did not want to face us hand-to-hand -hand combat. They saw how very, very proficient we were at doing our job. And I'm not at all saying that we should pick up physical arms and attack people. First and primarily, we're here to preach the Word. There may come a time where the Lord says, move, do it, in the, you know, take care of it in the flesh, but let it not be us. But let us be so proficient with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that we can very, well, like it says, it can clean bone from marrow. It can disjoint very precisely. I look at Peter and even Stephen. He was a table waiter. Just a lower servant, as if you want to put it on that category. But the word in his mouth, because he yielded to the Holy Spirit, was so piercing that they all rose up to kill him. That's how much damage it did to the enemy. They had to stop it right there to the point they had to come out and let everybody know what they were about. They wanted to do it, you know, con people and turn them against him like they tried with Jesus. But remember what Jesus would do with the Sadducees and Pharisees. He was so sharp and poignant. He knew exactly. He wouldn't always answer them. He'd ask them a question and put it back on there. You know, basically, I'm going to let you ruin yourselves. There's times he would answer them, but he was always very precise we can't be precise with our weaponry if we don't study it, if we don't train with it, if we don't eat and sleep it. You know, I think of David in Psalms, I believe it was one, that he meditates upon the law of the Lord day and night. He quit doing that at some point or he wouldn't have did the things he did. He quit eating it and drinking it every day and that night, dwelling on it. Be careful we don't fall in that same problem. Verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit with this in view. Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all saints. we got to have always a mind. And maybe we can't be there to help somebody stand in the physical, but we can pray. It says... Greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life. And that doesn't just mean I'll take a bullet for somebody. That means if I'm doing something and I feel so-and-so may need help and I can't be there, stop what I'm doing and pray for them. Because the Father can do it better than I could. That's how much love we should have for each other. That's how much devotion to the Lord we should have to where we'll stop whatever when He moves. Whether it's to talk to somebody, whether it's to pray for somebody, whether it's to get together and pray for somebody if we're in a group. That's the only way we're going to be victorious. He has chosen to place all of us in a time like no other. Worse than even Noah. It says it in Scripture. There's it's a time of tribulation now. It, it hadn't fully climaxed. But we know it's here. We can see what this country is doing. It's ripping itself apart. It's attacking anything with any kind of morals. Now it's for, uh, time for us to be battle ready and strong together, united. Praise God. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. That's good to be back. Back among the living. <laughs> oh, I, it's been a rough week. Let me tell you, that flu that's going around is no fun. But I'm on the mend. About healed up, praise God. <clears throat> Throat's still not 100%, but, you know, we, uh, of course, we was home watching. Uh, broadcast online and, and I kept seeing the back of somebody's head, you know, who is that? Who is that? And then I realized it's wits. Oh no, man, we we'll miss that old 
wetting them visit, but I hated that, but anyway. Anyway, today I wanted to look at uh, <coughs> uh, the, importance, the importance of names to God and because, uh, you know, our God is so big that one name cannot contain him or describe him or he has many names. Some are, some are titles, some are uh, just reveal some of his attributes or his character. And I just wanted to read a, a few of them. You know, it's, it's a lot, so, you know, I can't. You know, I didn't want to read a big long list, but I just wanted to go over some of the some of God's different names in the Old Testament first here. And uh, uh, El Shaddai, which means the Lord God Almighty, uh, and Yahweh Ra, which is the Lord my shepherd. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord that heals. Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide. Uh, others mean the Lord is peace, Lord of hosts. You know, there's a lot of different, a lot of names. And, uh, and some of the names, Jesus has many different names in the New Testament I wanted to look at. One, one is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Christ is the anointed one. And he's also called Prince of Peace, the Alpha and Omega, the first and last. And in John 1.1, 1, 1, he's called the Word of God. You know, and God, God thinks, you know, God's name is important enough to him that he made the third commandment about not taking his name in vain. And in, in <clears throat> what that means is for something useless or desolate, you know. But, uh, <clears throat> I want to look at uh, an instance here of where God changed somebody's name. And, uh, That is in Genesis 32. You know, Jacob's name means a planter, which is a, means someone that takes someone else's place. And, and we see that he's lived up his name pretty good because he's, you know, the story of how he tricked his brother Esau and out of his birthright. And then, of course, his, uh, all his dealings with his father-in-law Laban, because they, they both were <laughs> back and forth tricking each other, and they were both a couple of schemers. But uh, but in Genesis twenty two or thirty two twenty two, God put uh, God put put him through a life changing experience, <clears throat> and now he rose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream and he sent across whatever he had. And then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he had, when he had saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. And so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. 
He said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And, then, and uh, that's what the meaning of the name Israel is prevailer, one who prevails. And, you know, I guess God's seen that anyone, this guy's tenacious enough to wrestle with me all night. And I, that uh, he's not going to give up until he gets his blessing. So I better give him another name. <laughs> but uh, and also is Abraham, or Abram, started as Abram, which just simply means father. But his name was changed to Abraham, which is a father of a multitude which is what, you know, it's what he became. And in Proverbs uh, 22, verse 1, which looks like my marker fell out. <clears throat> It says that a good name is to be desired more than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. And throughout the whole book of Proverbs, you know, there's many places that de describe, you know, that, uh, you know, a good name, you know, that is something that is earned by living a life of honesty and doing what you say you'll do being trustworthy, you know, and that's a, a thing that uh, God says is greatly desired, is, a great, is, is better than great wealth. I also want to look at Acts for is there power in a name? Let's reject, let's start in verse one. Of course, uh, <clears throat> Peter and John had just healed a man at the, at the temple just before this, a lame man. And uh, we'll start here. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on him and put him in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message and believed, and a number of the men came to be about 5,000. And on the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed him in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to you, known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which came, became the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven which has been given among men by which we must be saved. So how much power is that? Now, that's the power of the universe behind God's name right there.
and look here. <clears throat> Let's look at what God says about his people in the future. In Revelation, in, in the letters to the seven churches, see what God says about our name. Let's look at uh, chapter 2, verse 17, which is... Uh, That is the uh, letter to the church of Pergamon. And at the end of it, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who ever comes, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which nobody knows but who receives it. And in chapter 3, verse 5, just a little over, to the church of Sardis, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And in verse 12, church of Philadelphia, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, and from my God, and my new name. So, so we can all look, whoever... To us, do we endure to the end? We overcome. We can look forward to a new name, directly from God, giving us a new name. And I sure look forward to finding out what that new new name is going to be. Praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Happy Sabbath to you all. Uh, we see in Acts chapter 6 that uh, it was determined by the apostles that it was expedient uh, for the church to appoint uh, deacons in order to serve the needs of the brethren. And today we're going to ordain one of our members who has served for a long time. I want to thank everybody because so many of you have served in so many different ways that uh, it's just been a blessing, you know, to see that selfless service. But we have one man who has been with us a long time and who truly uh, qualifies for the high office of deacon in the church of the living God, and that's John Murray. And today we're going to ordain him a deacon because he has been a lion and a lamb. He has been a lamb in that he laid down his life, he suffered abuse, he uh, does not take into account a wrong suffered, he is eager to forgive always. He uh, does not think highly of himself, and he esteems his brothers and sisters above all except for God. Uh, he is the grandson of Elva Sykes, and we can't honor him without giving honor to her, because she played a, a major role and raising this great man of God. So I just want to give Elva a hand of applause. And to let her know we appreciate and that the work that she has done and diligently, sacrificially, tirelessly raising him in the admonition of the Lord is not, God does not take lightly 
And I feel very sure in the spirit that it's, it is a precious stone in her crown. So I, she uh, deserves uh, a lot of respect, honor, and credit for the work that she has done. It's difficult in this world to raise someone in the admonition of the Lord and that they are faithful their entire life and that they never go astray. And that's what we have in John Murray. And I don't know what his name is going to be and I don't know what his name is now in the halls of heaven. But if you just think about it, Jacob had a different name than Jacob in the halls of heaven because he was willing to hang on, to endure pain, to endure suffering, to hang on to the Lord for a blessing. Even though his hip was out of place, the Lord tested him. He put him in a situation where it was painful, very uncomfortable and difficult, but he would not let go. All night he endured and he suffered for that blessing of the Lord. And that's how he valued the blessing of the Lord. Very few people, most people will let go as soon as some little trouble comes up or some of they have to get offended here or there or they have a little problem. And they don't have the character that Jacob had, but this man does. And some of you do. I don't know what his name is in heaven. I don't know what the Lord calls him, but I call him faithful and true. I do know that the Lord, you know, moved me to bless him once, privately. And the Lord, in the blessing, said that he was our anchor. So perhaps his name is Hope, faithful and true companion, and faithful servant of God's people and of God himself. So you can turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1, it is, a trustworthy, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. And of course, this, this is the office of, of a shepherd or a pastor. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, or not more than one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, or pugnacious which means argumentative, wants to argue. But gentle, peaceable, wanting to find peace, free from the love of money, he must be one who manages his own household well. And he must have a good reputation, verse 7, from those outside the church, so that he will not fall into the reproach of the devil. Now, verse 8, deacons likewise must be men of dignity. They have to have the same attributes. Not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And these men must also be tested, and then let them serve as deacons, if they are beyond reproach. And this brother, in my view, is beyond reproach. And so at this time, we're going to have John come up and the uh, elders come up, and then we're going to ordain him uh, to the office of deacon in the Church of the Living God. before you today on this most holy day you know and we are so thankful father that you have provided for us a man of such character that to serve in this body 
And we recognize, Father, as I know you do, that you've been serving for many years. But, Father, you have moved me and have been moving me a while to make it official and to officially anoint him for this work of service, to ordain him to the high office and the honor of deacon in the church of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we now, according to your will, we declare him and accept that you have given to us this man as a servant of this body to serve in the office as de deacon. And we thank you, Father. We ask that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you would guide him and lead him, Father, in this position to faithfully execute this position. We ask, Father, that you would empower him and give him even magnified gifts, Father, in order to fulfill this service. And may he be a deacon in the likes of Stephen, as he was speaking of in his sermonette just a moment ago. But that's how we see him. And I believe that's how you see him. And we think we are gratefully receive this man in this capacity to serve us, Lord. And we thank you and we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Everybody hug him. We have the congregation up to, Bless you. to greet our new deacon. First we got him. Bill.
Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim a deception? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Welcome all of you who are watching today. Wish you a happy Sabbath. Hope you're having a blessed day today. Uh, we do have special music today, but before that, if anyone has any uh, prayer requests you'd like us, maybe pr private requests, you'd like us to burn with our incense, uh, write it down, hold it up, or bring it up, put it in this bowl. We do have special music. Adam is going to sing How Great Thou Art, and Brian is going to sing Draw Near. Uh, also, a reminder, a week from tomorrow is the uh, Right to Life March in Little Rock, and we'll be meeting here somewhere around noon on Sunday and uh, making our way to the state capitol and Little Rock, Arkansas. Look forward to that. Uh, do we have anyone? I know Elba wants to be anointed. Anyone else? There's one, two, okay. Uh, any updates? Do we have any updates on Gerard? We don't know anything about the spot on the lung or anything yet. Not yet. <clears throat> Co continue to uh, pray for Gerard uh, Retzer, uh, which is, who is married to Jody's sister, and uh, for God to bring about a great healing. Amen. All right. Uh, do, did we have some? We did. We got one. All right. Okay, so we'll have Jody come up and pray over these prayer requests, and then we'll have special music. Adam, you'll be first. So I can go. Dear great and awesome Heavenly Father, it's, it's such a wonderful thing to be called your children, Lord, and just to be able to come before you because of the sacrifice of your son Jesus and lift these prayer requests to you today and Father we know you'll do the best thing that is possible and Lord we just look forward to the answered prayers here and and the testimony that will come from it Lord we love you and we thank you in Jesus name Amen, amen. <clears throat>
I'm not afraid. 
shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great Thou art Then sings my soul Draw near to you 
Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. <sighs> there is no justice in this present world. Now, it may seem like there's justice. We use the term, bring someone to justice. We often, you know, cite uh, situations like someone has committed murder. And we want them brought to justice. And some of us believe in the death penalty. And to a degree, we may think, well, Justice is served when a murderer, uh, when his life is taken. But that's not the fullness of justice. It's still unjust in the sense that the victim is still dead. Amen. The family of the victim, their friends, acquaintances, co-workers, still suffer the pain of loss. So there is no justice in this world. If there is no God, there is no afterlife. And if there is no afterlife, there is no judgment. And if there is no judgment, there is no justice. Yet in our very being, the very, we're hardwired in our very soul to cry out for justice. But there is no justice. Only a fool lives his life believing that he or she will receive justice in this life. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If there is no resurrection, of course there is no resurrection, there's no judgment, no judgment, there's no justice, there's no reward, there's no penalty. Murderers, torturers will go free. They will never have paid for what they have done. People who live virtuous lives as best as they can, we're all unjust, but those who have lived as best they can, 
to be honorable, to be faithful to God, to be loving neighbors to one another, they will never be rewarded for what they have done, for the sacrifices they have made. If there's no God, if there's no judgment, there is no justice. But there is a God. And there is an afterlife. And there is a judgment, and thank God for it. Because you see, the judgment is not so much about punishment. The judgment is about justice. God is a just God. He is a just judge. I saw a photograph on Fox News this week that was going viral. And it showed a five-year-old girl in a hospital bed filled with tubes dying. She was diagnosed five weeks earlier with brain cancer. And that little five-year-old was dying. You know why? Because we live in a fallen world. That's why. We live in a fallen world. And if you think that God is always going to intervene in this fallen world, you're, you're sadly mistaken. Did God stop Cain from killing his brother Abel? He counseled him. Don't do it. Sin is crouching at the door. It's desires for you, and you must overcome it. But God didn't stop it. God did not stop that injustice from happening. Abel was righteous. Why did Cain kill him? 1 John chapter 3 says that Cain killed his brother because his deeds were not righteous and his brother's deeds was righteous. That's all it takes. If you want to live a righteous life in Christ Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be treated unjustly. Does that bother you? Well, you better get over it. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, you're going to suffer as Christ did. Too many people want the gain without the pain. Did you know with every blessing comes a burden? Did you know that? Have you ever even thought about that? Think about it. Every blessing that you receive comes with a burden. And that's a fact. You received a burden today. John was blessed today to be anointed as a deacon in this church, but a burden was placed on your shoulder that you must bear in a way that you weren't bearing it before. For every blessing, there's a burden. Jesus went through the, he carried his cross. He went to the cross. He laid down on it. But you know what he said? He said, you take up your cross and you follow me. You got one too. Without labor, there is no birth. Without labor, there is no child. Without work, there's no paycheck. You know, if someone gets accomplished or skilled at a musical instrument or any kind of craft or whatever it happens to be, you know how it came about? Through the burden, a repetitious practice of experience on the job. That's how it came about. That blessing came with a burden, and it carries a burden. A lot of people want to pray for blessings, and God tells us to pray for blessings. But don't pray for blessings for more than what you can deal with a burden that comes with it. Amen? Because the truth of the matter is, if you think you're excessively burdened and you think that you're treated unjustly, you think it's a miscarriage of justice. And when you think there's a miscarriage of justice, that then will allow you to be open. You're opening your heart for the seed of bitterness to be planted right in it. There's more bitter seeds in people's hearts because of a perceived miscarriage of justice than anything else. Think of things that, just think of things that people, that people believe that are unjust. A hypocrite. If someone is a hypocrite, he's a pretender, he's an actor. That's perceived as a miscarriage of justice. It's not who. It's not being revealed who he or she really is. You see, they're getting away with something. Nobody gets away with anything. You know, the Bible talks a lot of times. I mean, the, you know, the psalmist, David, cries out, How come? 
Solomon cries out in Proverbs. How come? Jeremiah cries out in his prophecies. Isaiah cries out. How come, Lord, why is it that the wicked prosper? Everything is taken from the righteous. The righteous have a hard time. They have difficulties. And then here's the wicked. <laughs> they don't even have pains in their death. They do what they want. They take people's property. They exploit people for money. They made it murder someone. How is it that you're letting this happen? Well, the Lord is patient. The Lord says, well, I send rain on the just and the unjust alike. But don't neglect the fact that there is a God who is a righteous judge and there is an afterlife and there is a judgment and at that judgment, justice will be served. And we have to be very careful because we all live in glass houses. We are all unjust. And we all tend to have a stricter standard for others than we do for ourselves. And that's a fact. That's why Jesus said, be careful how you judge. Don't judge. Because however you judge, you're going to be judged that way. You know, God does, he's going to destroy the wicked, but you know what he says? I don't take any pleasure in that. I do not take any pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Think about unjust things. I was talking about that little girl. She was laying that picture, the photograph that went viral. She was laying in her hospital bed dying. But what made the photograph go viral was in a recliner right beside her bed was her grandfather. And he was laying there and leaning back just helpless with his head back and just distraught. He was just in anguish. Nothing he could do but to sit there and watch his little granddaughter, five-year-old, suffer and die. St. Jude's Hospital is filled with little children who are dying of cancer or other diseases. You go out to St. Mary's, there'll be children in there. There's children in every. There's a hundred and, you know, there's 125,000 abortions yesterday. Did you hear me? I said there was 125,000 abortions yesterday. There was 3,000 in America. Did you know that half of all pregnancies are unplanned? And do you know that half of those unplanned pregnancies are terminated by abortion? So you want to talk about justice in the world? There is no justice in the world. There is no justice in the world. Because even though someone pays for what they have done, they can't undo what they did. Amen? Only a righteous God. Do you know what we find in Revelation chapter 21? God is going to make all things new. Only God can take away the past. You see, nothing is impossible with God. He has taken away our past already when we were baptized and received the Holy Spirit, born again. We find that we died. We were crucified with Christ, Romans chapter 6. And we were risen with him. And even now, somehow, we are seated in heavenly places. He's the lover of our soul. We were created for his pleasure. That's what we were created for. We, were, we weren't created for ourselves. We were created for him and for his glory and for his pr pleasure <clears throat> to fulfill the purpose for which he created us. As a created thing, we should seek the will of our creator and say, what is it that you would have me do? How is it that you would have me be? How is it that you would have me think? How is it that you would have me speak? 
And you know what he tells us in his word. This is how I want you to be. And I'm going to send you an example. His name is Jesus. And he's going to be born of a lowly peasant girl who's going to be accused of fornication. And he'll be thought of as illegitimate his whole life. And that will be brought up. You know, there's something in Luke chapter 1. When Gabriel appeared to Mary, that here's a young teenage girl from the tribe of Judah. And Gabriel appeared to her and told her, you're blessed among women, for the Lord has chosen you to bear a son who will forgive all the sins of your people. And it's easy to overlook one particular verse there early on. And we just think of what Barry actually said. As you will. As you will. I I am your servant. I'll do what you want. But before she ever said that to Gabriel, God reveals to us how she felt and, and what she was thinking at the time. It is said In her mind and in her heart, she was perplexed. She was perplexed and she was troubled. And she was wondering, what kind of blessing is this? You see, she received the greatest blessing that any woman has ever received. But you know what? She recognized immediately that a burden came with it. And she was perplexed, and she was troubled. And God revealed what she was thinking. She didn't say it. She was thinking it. God knew. And God said what she was thinking. What kind, what is this? How is this to be? What kind of blessing is this? I'm perplexed. I'm troubled. I understand it's an honor. That's what she was thinking. Yes, it's an honor. But wow. Nobody else is going to think it's an honor. Who's going to know? Gabriel's not going to go down and appear to all of Israel and, or have God come down in a cloud and speak to all the children of Israel and said, Mary is blessed among women. For I have chosen her to give birth to the Messiah who will save his people and will rule as a soon coming king. She is the mother of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, that would have been a lot easier. Amen. <laughs> if I'd been Mary, I might have asked Gabriel, hey, can we announce it? <laughs> can we send out a memo <laughs> so that other people can know? But she suffered, and she bore that burden, and she suffered quietly. And she's esteemed now among women because of it. In lesser ways, that's what we're called to do. Amen. Amen. Think of Paul and Silas being beaten in Philippi, bloody, unjustly, unjustly beaten. They were both Roman citizens. They deserved a trial. They weren't given a trial. They were beaten. Did you hear them screaming, My rights have been violated! What did they do? They rejoiced. In the middle of the night, beaten and bloody, hanging, you know, in the innermost part, the most secure part of a prison, and they began to praise God. They began to give God thanks for the burden that they were bearing. Because they didn't just see it as a burden. They knew that if there's a burden, there's a blessing. But also, if there's a blessing, there's a burden. They are related. One doesn't come without the other. And as they began to praise God, God caused an earthquake and all the doors of the prison opened up and the prisoners didn't run out. They could have ran out. They could have escaped. They could have used that opportunity to escape. The jailer came in and thought they had escaped, but they had ran in 
to where they heard the praise. Now look, any rational person is thinking, whoever's in the innermost part of the prison is somebody that deserves to be there. You don't think you're going to respect them. Well, they must have done something really bad. I mean, they're in the most secure part of this prison. But the Holy Spirit was moving, and they ran in, and a church was started in Philippi. You see, that's the blessing. That's what came out of it. Now, what if, though, they had not? What if they had had a critical, negative attitude? What if they had blamed God? Well, what you sent us here, and now we're in prison. What if they had had a negative? What if they had viewed that beating, that arrest of that beating, as not a blessing, but as an injustice? I've been unjustly treated. This is a great injustice. Don't you know I'm a Roman citizen? And you have violated the law of Rome, and you'll pay for it. That's how most people think. That's what most people would do. But they didn't. And because they did what they were supposed to do, what God had told them to do, God blessed them. Amen? Amen. Not only that, guess what happened? The jailer was saved. His whole family was saved. The church at Philippi was started and became a thriving church in Macedonia. That was a Macedonian call. I'm going somewhere else. The Holy Spirit says, wait a minute, a man from Macedonia is calling, calling. Well, all right, I'll go there. I'll go to Macedonia. And there at Macedonia, home of the great general, Alexander the Great's father, Philip. There they are arrested. They're beaten unjustly. No one even inquires. Maybe they said, they probably did say, no, wait a minute, I, I am a Roman citizen. Paul, it doesn't tell us there. Unless the Holy Spirit maybe told them not to. But the Holy Spirit kept them from it. Because they said it later on, you see. But they said it later on not to get out of a punishment. They said it later on because they said, look, <laughs> uh, now that we know that you're a Roman citizen, we're going to let you out of jail. We really apologize. Now you can leave our city. But because Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, see, they had a little, uh, you know, they had a little weight behind them now. And they said, well, I think we'll stick around. There's some people here that, that we've come to know, and we want to spend some time with them. And the church was started there. You think of the life of Joseph. I mean, we, we've talked about that. So many of us here have, have spoke about that behind this podium. But it's really true. All the terrible injustices that happened to Joseph, not just to Joseph, to his father Jacob. Think of that. And all the people who loved Joseph, Joseph back home. But he was unjustly sold into slavery. They wanted to kill him. He was unjustly you know, uh, accused by Potiphar's wife and ended up in prison for 10 years. But God has a way of bringing something out. See, it was a blessing that that happened. But along the way, he had to carry a big burden, many burdens, didn't he? He had to carry some burden. He had to be, carry the burden of being away from his father, uh, of, of understanding that his brothers had had thought so small of him, just was so envious of him to sell him into slavery, that he was falsely accused and he loved his master. So he had to endure burdens. But in the burdens were the blessings. It was a blessing that he was there. It was a blessing. And he said that. He said, you meant it for evil, he told his brothers, but God meant it for good. He brought about good for it. And we don't have to worry about injustices. We don't have to worry about what anyone does to us or if we think someone else is getting away with something that's quite petty. Anyway, that's not an honorable character to have, part, a trait to have in our character. But history is filled with examples of injustice. That happens every day. 
Did you know for 800 years there's been slavery in two African countries, North Africa? Uh, that's been a perpetual slave. I, I'm saying for 800 years there are slaves whose their families have been slaved, enslaved to other families for more than 800 years in two countries in Africa. They don't know anything but being born a slave. Their parents were born a slave. Their children are born slaves. Their property, they can be treated, uh, worked hard, sold. They're treated as property. They can do, people can do. Is that just? Of course it's not just. It's not just at all. Does God hate injustice? Of course he does. But does God allow injustice? Yes, he does. He allows injustice <clears throat> because he has given us free will. He wants to see what you do. That's what he wants. Whenever there's a perception of a miscarriage of justice, it reveals our heart. Amen? If our first response is <clears throat> like if someone, like John was saying, in his sermon, if someone does something to you, what is your first response? The first response should be to pray God. It would be like what Jesus said, or like even Stephen said when he was being stoned. Don't lay it at their charge. Father, forgive them. Because if we have the attitude of Jonah, we want to sit up on a hill and look at a city and want Nineveh to be destroyed, you see. He hated the sins of Nineveh, but Nineveh repented. But to Jonah, they're the same old, uh, you know, fish god worshiping pagans, and I don't like them, you know. But God spared them, and it upset Jonah because Jonah was self righteous. You know, that the only, the seed of bitterness can only be planted in the heart of a self righteous person. That's a fact. It has to be in a self-righteous person because you're thinking yourself as higher than someone else. The standard is different for me than it is for someone else. You see. It comes back to self. Oh, it's about me. Or oh, it's about me. It's about my husband. It's about my wife. It's about my kid. It's about my mama or my daddy. Let's go over to 1 Kings chapter 21. We're going to read the story of Naboth and his vineyard, Ahab who wanted his vineyard, and Jezebel who figured out a way to get his vineyard from him. And it is an example of a great injustice. And understand God did not Stop it. He didn't stop Cain from killing Abel. But Abel's blood speaks. That's what we find in Hebrews. We find Jesus said that Abel is named among the righteous. Abel had to bear the burden of being murdered by his own brother. Adam and Eve had to bear the burden of having their child murdered. Abel's family had to bear the burden of the father, the husband, being murdered. Now it came about after these things that Naboth, notice the Jezreelite, so he's from the region of Jezreel. He had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. Samaria is in the land of Ephraim, which is the son of Joseph. Ahab and the northern kingdom. Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is close beside my house. And I will give you an even better vineyard, they did in his place. Or if you like, I'll give you the price of it in money. He's basically saying, name your price. But I want you to notice what Naboth said. Now, Naboth had, here, here he is. He's faced with a great business decision. Wow. You know what? I can get something even better. 
or I can get a lot of money for this because the king wants it. The problem is, it was against the commandment from God. Because God had commanded in Numbers chapter 36, verse 7, that when the land was given to the children of Israel, each tribe and where the families were, that that could not, like, if it's, if it, it has to stay in the tribe. Jezreel could not sell his vineyard to a person who was not in his tribe. And Ahab was not in his tribe. God had commanded it. Numbers 36, verse 7. And Naboth knew that. And Naboth cared about the will of God. Of course, Ahab didn't. And Naboth, but Naboth said to Ahab, Well, the Lord forbid me. He said, I can't do that. The Lord has forbidden that. The Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. He said, remember back when God gave us the inheritance of the land? He told us that you can't, you know, you know each tribe has this property and someone from another tribe can have this property. We can only trade within the tribes. So Ahab came to his house, sullen and vexed. He's pouting. Because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and he turned away his face and he ate no food. So he's really down and out. I mean, he's bummed out here. He's pouting. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, How is it that your spirit is so sullen sullen, and you are not eating any food? What's wrong with you, Ahab? I mean, what's up? So he said to her, because I I spoke to Nabal, the Jezreelite, and I said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you a vineyard in his place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, and of course, Jezebel is a pagan. Already, uh, uh, Ahab is unequally yoked. And of course, that probably contributed to him uh, being the way he was. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now reign over Israel? What's wrong with you? I thought you were the king. Back where I come from, if you're the king, you just take what you want. That's what she's saying. Do you not reign over Israel? Arise, eat bread, and let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she, now notice what she did. She wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent letters to the elders and to the nobles who were living with Naboth in his city. Now Ahab was wicked, but he wasn't that wicked. Now she wrote in the letters saying, notice, proclaim, proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the people. And seat two worthless men before him and let them testify against him saying, you curse God and you curse the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. That's how we'll get the vineyard. So they probably paid these false witnesses. Now, this is a great injustice, isn't it? Look at this plot against a man. And the only reason... I mean, he would profit from letting Ahab have the vineyard, except he knew that it was against God's will. So what is Naboth doing? What is his objective? His objective is to do the will of God. Maybe it's not a good business decision. Maybe you're losing profit. But you're putting your trust in God. And because he was righteous, the devil took notice, of course. So now they said, now here's what you do. You proclaim a fast and you seat Naboth at the head of the the people and sit two worthless men, these false spies, And let them testify against him, saying, you curse God and you curse the king. Take him out then and stone him. 
Verse 11. So the men of his city, the elders of the nobles who lived in his city, and these people probably really thought of Naboth as a very righteous person. The reason he wouldn't sell this vineyard because he was obeying the will of God. And they did as Jezebel had sent word to them. Of course, they think it comes from the king, Ahab, because she had written his name. She had put his seal on the letters. She had cooked up this plot. So she had sent word to them, just as it was written in the letters which she had sent them. Verse 12, they proclaimed a fast, and they seated Naboth <clears throat> at the head of the people. Then the two worthless men came and sat down, sat before him, and the worst, worthless men testified against him, even against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth cursed God, and he cursed the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. It was two witnesses. You know, a matter will be resolved on the basis of two or three witnesses. Well, there's two witnesses. This was a great injustice. <clears throat> then they sent word to Jezebel saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. When Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. Now imagine, since Ahab is married to Jezebel, he probably has a pretty good idea of what happened, but he don't want to ask. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelites, to take possession of it. So he's going to go down there and say, okay, I'm going to plant peas here. I'm going to plant some grapes over here. Oh, I don't know. He's going to decide, looking over his, his vineyard, deciding what he's going to plant where. But then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. So what happened is, is that even though this happened, God spoke to Ahab. God met Ahab at the vineyard. And he spoke to him through the prophet Elijah. And he said, I want to tell you what's going to happen to you. You're going to die because of this. This is what's going to happen to you. Your blood is going to be spilled by the wall of Jezreel. And your wife, the dogs are going to eat her. You know where? By the wall of Jezreel. That's where. And uh, what scared Ahab to death? I mean, he did. I mean, he, he went fasting, put on sackcloth. He, he repented. He wasn't like Jezebel. But he was greatly influenced like Jezebel, just like Samuel. Or not Samuel, but Solomon was influenced by his pagan wives. That's why we're not unequally yoked. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, don't be unequally, don't be bound to unbelievers. Don't be unequally yoked. What fellowship has light with darkness? None. Now, can you have a relationship? Yeah. It can be based on different things. It can be based on certain likes that you both have. It can be based on sex. It can be based on, you know, different things. But you don't have fellowship. The only way a person of light has fellowship with someone in the darkness is they come out of the light and go into the darkness. And you agree with one another. And you practice the way of the world. You know, there's a fellowship with the world, there's a fellowship with God, but you can't do both. God calls us out of this world to be lights in the world. Amen. So Ahab repented, and God sent word to Elijah. And I imagine it was a burden for Elijah. It was a burden for Elijah to have to go tell Ahab. He didn't know but what Ahab would kill him. That's what usually happens when a prophet comes with a word like that to a king. But in this case, it really frightened Ahab. He saw the gravity. He saw the seriousness seriousness of it. He knew that murder had been committed and he actually repented. And God then came to Elijah and said, Ahab is 
has repented, therefore I'm not going to exercise that justice on him. I'm going to wait. And then you know the story. Ahab actually gets shot in battle. It took him all day, I think, to die. He lay there with an arrow in him that went between where the armor, you know, fastened, the area between the armor. But Jezebel, listen, Jezebel came up with the story. Jezebel came up with the plot. It was Jezebel's idea. Ahab was just going to, you know, have, have a little pity party about it, you know, and feel, you know, down about not being able to get the victory. But he wasn't going to go take it. But she had him murdered, unjustly accused and stoned to death. And then now you can have your vineyard. She lived on. Even after Ahab lived for years. Jezebel lived many years. Where was God's justice? Where was there justice in the world? Because she didn't stop doing wicked things. She led God's people astray. We find that she was continually, continually leading God's people astray. Do you know what God did? Store up the wrath. That's what he did. He did not stop her. And you know, most of the time people, they receive what they want to receive. If they receive a negative word, it's because they want to receive a negative word. Amen? If they want, uh, you know, to, to be introduced into paganism, it's because that intrigues them. They don't see it as really evil. You see, they're not like Naboth who wanted to obey. He could have made a prophet, but he didn't. Now let's go over to Matthew chapter 7. Yeah, I think of even Bartimaeus, who was born blind. I mean, you know, when they were saying, well, then why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sins or the sins of his parents? And Jesus said, neither one. But it was for the glory of God. So he lived his whole life. He was like a living sacrifice. God knew when he was born. That's the one that I'm going to give sight to. And what did it do? It brought glory to him. It brought glory to God, you see. Here in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, do not judge, verse 1, so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Now see, most people don't want to be judged by how they judge. Uh, if they think about it. I know I don't. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. And that's a very strong word. First take the, I mean, a hypocrite, you're saying, you know, you're accusing someone else of doing something you yourself do. And the fact of the matter is, we're all unjust. Every one of us. We're not supposed to show partiality. But we do. Even when we don't want to, we find we look like, oh, well, I'll show partiality maybe, you know. We don't do what we want. Like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I agree with the law of God, but I find that the members of my body do the very thing I hate. Because we have that body of death that is present with us at all times. We cannot let death Reign. We can't let sin reign. We can't let the devil reign or his ways reign. It's going to come up. Those things are going to come up. Envy, resentment, impatience, uh, wrath, anger, unrighteous anger, uh, you know, envy, jealousy. Those uh, critical, accusative spirit, those things are going to come up. 
And we have to overcome them, just like God told uh, Cain to overcome it. It's crafting that he was feeling a strong urge to strike out at his brother. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And that's a principle there. We're, we're, we're to go to one another. We're to strengthen, even to even rebuke one another, the Bible says. But this is a principle where Jesus said, you know, make sure you're right first. Make sure that, you know, you're right. And then when you do it, do it in a spirit of gentleness, uh, trying to restore the person that is in error. Let's go over to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you, who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Are we all sinners outside of Christ? We all are. And you know, the thing about it is, we should be very concerned when someone we love or someone we know does something wrong, even if they do it to us. Amen? We should be concerned for them. Our concern should not be, is it God going to do something about that person? Because if he starts with them, he ends up with us. Amen? I mean, if we have that attitude, it comes back to us, right? I mean, that's what happens. You said, that's a boomerang. You send it out to hit somebody, knock somebody on the head, but it's going to come back and get you. I mean, that's the truth. For, see, therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who, judge, who passes judgment, in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And he's saying, it'll rightly fall on you too. It gets you both. That's what he's saying. But you don't know but what that other person may be like Ahab. Or like David. Yes, I had Uriah, or uh, yeah, Uriah killed, but I repented. Yes, I let my wife cook up a plot to have Naboth killed so I could get his vineyard. But I saw the error and I repented. You know, while you look at what somebody else has done, you don't know if they repented. And the truth of the matter is, that's what your prayer should be. Your heart should be that they repent, that they would not come under the justice of God, but that whatever justice that they deserved upon them would have, Jesus would have borne at the cross, the judgment there. But do you suppose this, old man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same thing yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? <laughs> well, no. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repent? That's what it's designed to, to do, is to lead you to repentance. You know, when we point a finger at somebody else, you know, and pointing out, being critical and pointing out their faults or where they're wrong uh, without looking at ourselves and understanding that the only reason, what keeps us being from under the wrath of God 
is his kindness, his tolerance, his patience. But that is designed to lead us to repentance. It's designed for us to see that we need those things without those things of his that he freely gives us, including forgiveness and passing over us. Think about it. He removes our sins. He remembers them no more, we find in Hebrews chapter 8 and also in chapter 10. In this covenant, he remembers our lawless deeds no more. That, how valuable is that? That's how he makes us a son. Other, if, we weren't, if, he didn't rem, if he remembered our sins, we would be like recovering criminals. We would be like convicts that, uh, where he just let out of prison. But not only does he remember our sins no more, he doesn't remember them. He puts them away. When you ask forgiveness, he puts them away. But when you want him to remember somebody else's sins, you see, well, then he will remember your sins. It's a dangerous place. If we're upset about someone that's sinning, we should be upset that they're sinning. Because in reality, how does someone really sin against me? What do I have that anyone could take? What do I have that God, that does not belong to God? If a person sins against me, are they really sinning against God? If a person sins against somebody, they're really sinning against God because the person that they're sinning against is also worthy of the same judgment because we're all sin. We're all sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So without the glory of God, without his forgiveness, we're all lost. No one is going to stand at the judgment and say, look at me, I'm better than that person. That won't happen. It's like Jesus telling the story about the Pharisee and the tax gatherer collector that was in the temple. And uh, the Pharisee was self-righteous and he was telling God about all the things that he did to honor him. I fast twice a week. And I tithe, not only my regular tithe, but I mean, even the leaves off my plants, I give them to you. I'm glad I'm not like that old guy over there. That guy that is a tax gatherer, he comes and oppresses your people and he steals from them. And he, he gets more money than what the Roman government says he's supposed to get. He lines his pockets with those. But I'm glad I'm not like that old sinner over there. And you know what? Jesus said something remarkable. That man over there just, he knew what he was. The Pharisee did not. He was blind. He was so blinded to who he was. And that man just tore his robe and said, forgive me, a sinner, I'm a sinner. I don't want to even lift my eyes to you, Lord. I'm not worthy to even look up at you. I'm just going to look down. And Jesus said, you know, when they left, one went justified, and it was the one, the tax gatherer. He was the one that left justified before God because no one is going to stand haughty before God. But you know what? We're standing before God every day. God lives in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in you right now. The very one said, don't judge, lest you be judges in you right now. And the Holy Spirit will tell you that right now. The Holy Spirit will tell you when that's happening. You better back off. You better quit. Verse 4, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? You should know that it is the kindness of God that is designed to lead you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now let's not let this escape our attention. This is a letter from the Apostle Paul to the saints at Rome. He's not writing this to the world. He's not saying... 
you people of the world are storing up wrath for yourself. No. He said, if you do what I just said, you judge others, more uh, critical of others, when you yourself are doing the same thing, you're a hypocrite and you're self-righteous. You're putting yourself above them. When the Apostle Paul clearly had said uh, to the Ephesians, each esteem one another as greater than yourself. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'll tell you how you don't do it. You don't do it by focusing in on everybody's weaknesses or problems they have or perceived ideas of things you think they're doing wrong or something like that because you're going to have an exalted opinion of you and a lesser opinion of them. Well, that's a fact. There's lots of things we don't know that are not that you don't see on the outside. Just like you didn't see on the outside maybe that, that David had repented. You didn't see on the outside maybe that Ahab had repented, but he did. And God saw it on the inside. And so some people were probably walking around that knew what Jezebel did. They're probably saying, well, what's Jezebel? how come Ahab is still king? Why hasn't God done something about this? How is it that we have a wicked king? Is God not just or what? Oftentimes we get what we deserve, and the people get what they deserve. So he says, but because of your stubbornness, verse 5, and the unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself, and the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. This is when justice will be served. Don't expect it today. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. I mean, like, my, don't you want to be a part of the great cloud of witnesses? Come on. Well, what do you expect? Really, what do you expect? Do you expect, do you expect someone to roll out a red carpet for you and, uh, and, you know, lay the palm branches out so you can just walk, live your life and everything's just so, ch- ch- you know, ch- ch- perfect? I mean, come on. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what happened with the great cloud of witnesses. What do we find the great cloud of witnesses? Abraham had to leave the greatest city that there has ever been in Ur, a city of peace, to live in a desert filled with bandits. He had to endure not having any children till he was an old man. Sarah had to endure until she was an old woman, thinking she would never have any children, thought to be cursed of God because of it. My womb is cursed. I'm barren. That's a burden that she bore. Noah, the only righteous person during the time of the flood, won. We find Abel, who was killed by his brother Cain. And then what does it say there? All of these lived and died without receiving the promises. Why aren't we impatient? I want mine. I want it now. I want my justice right now. I want justice now in this world. Well, God may just start with you. How about that? If it bothers you so much, it bothers me. It bothers me that children die. Of cancer. It bothers me that children are being molested. It bothers me that ever so often that, that our school teachers, a lot of our women school teachers are having affairs with, with children. It bothers me. I don't like it. But I'm not God. It bothers God. And He pleads. But He doesn't stop it. It won't be stopped until Satan is no longer the ruler of this world. And that will happen when Jesus returns and the government is established upon this earth. And he rules the nations with a rod of iron. And then there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And the old things will have passed away. And God will then wipe away every tear and he will renew all things. He'll make all things new. The old things will be gone. It will be as if they never happened. And perhaps it will be that they never happened. I don't know. God can do it. God can do it. 
That's our hope. That's what we look forward to. That's what we have to put our trust in. You know, regardless of, you can bring people, you can arrest people that are abusing their children. That may be locked, we've seen stories of children who were locked in a closet for years and who were starving, never allowed to come out. They're in their own waste, living in that filth. And right on the other side, family goes on as normal. It's just wicked. It's just evil in this world. And you know, those people are caught sometimes and they're incarcerated. They're put on trial, they're found guilty, and they go to jail. And I'm glad. I'm happy when I hear that happen, but I'm sad by the fact that it happened. But I'm not foolish. I understand that justice was not served. And that what the injustice that had occurred had not been undone. We should really try to look through the eyes of Jesus and of our Father who's not slow. He wants to send Jesus. But he wants to give people time to repent. He's not slow in his coming and finding Second Peter, but he will, he doesn't desire that anyone should perish, but that all would come to repentance. He wants to spend his wrath on his son. He doesn't want to spend his wrath on the wicked, and we should never ever want to expend our wrath on somebody. We should always have the heart and and the desire that God has, oh Lord, that they would only turn, only change, that they would only repent. My, God received Ahab's repentance. I, I don't know how deep that repentance was. He stayed married to Jezebel, you know. So the righteous, the revelation of the day of wrath, verse 5, the righteous revelation, the righteous judgment, the revelation of the righteous judgment, who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good, it's not easy to do good, it's not easy to push away the wicked desires, the bitterness, the self-righteous to be a grumbler, to be a fault finder. God hates, he hates that. To those who, by perseverance and doing good, seek for glory and honor and immorality, immortality, eternal life. Notice that. For those who, by perseverance and doing good. It's hard. You got to do it. Well, when is it? When do you have to persecute, uh, persevere in doing good? Not when everybody's nice to you. <laughs> Really? That's not when everybody's nice to you. It's easy. That's not perseverance. Perseverance is when you push through and you do what is hard to do, when it doesn't feel like that's what you want to do, when you feel like, you're, you know, like, like old Fred Sanford, I'm going to knock you out, you know. You say to me, some of those guys, to those who by perseverance are doing good, well, when you do that, you're seeking for glory. And, your, and for honor and uh, immortality and eternal life. But those who are selfish, ambitious, selfishly ambitious, whatever it feels good, whatever that feels good for them to hold, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. That's what's going to happen. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man. You hear that? who does evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and to the Greek. Chapter 14. Verse 
Verse 7. For not one of our lives, for not one of us lives for himself. And not one dies for himself. Can we internalize that? Not one of us lives for himself. That's how it's supposed to be. And not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are, are the Lord's. So why are we worried about ourselves? Why are we worried about what we have or don't have or what somebody did to me or, or, or you know, I mean, come on. That's not Christianity. We submitted, we gave our life to the Lord. We said, your will be done. That's, you know, our hope is in the resurrection. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if we don't believe in the resurrection, we're the most pitied of all people. I mean, my, look what we go through. Look what we have to endure. Look at the burdens we bear. Look at the persecutions we suffer. Look at this. And he talked to it, you know, in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about all he went through. Well, what gave him the strength to go and to continue on? It was the glory to come. He put trust in God. I just want to make sure that God's wrath doesn't follow me. That's all you can do. Make sure it doesn't follow me on you. And that you're free. From those things. So not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died. This is the reason he died. And lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Is he your Lord? Well, don't complain where he leads you. Amen? Amen? But you, why do you judge your brother? Are you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. He said, don't you know that? You might be like, Jonah, I want a front row seat when that guy gets judged. <laughs> Maybe he'll be on the throne with Jesus while you're judged. Maybe that person repented. Maybe God saw his heart differently. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. Of course, we don't want to do that. Now let's go over to Mark chapter 10 quickly. We'll finish up here in just a moment. Mark chapter 10. Uh, this is Mark's uh, account just after uh, the young rich ruler uh, that rejected Jesus' offer to come and follow him because he had great riches. Now, verse 26, it says, wow. They were astonished and said, well, who can be saved? Verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said, well, with people it is impossible, but with God all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything and we followed you. Lord, we, we've given everything. Well, that's a great cloud of witnesses. You know, I talked about the, the ones who had, who had uh, you know, that followed and, and followed in faith, trusted in God, and did not receive the prom promises. But I didn't go on to talk about the ones who were killed, the ones who were, uh, suffered exposure, those who lived in caves. I didn't go on to talk about all those. Those of whom it says that the world was not worthy of. That's a part of your body. And you're a part of their body. Don't disgrace it. You hear? You want to hear one of them crying around about something being unjust. 
They weren't stupid. They knew they lived in an unjust world. Do you expect anything different if Satan is the god of this world? Come on. What do you expect? Do you think you should be treated like royalty? Of course not. You are royalty. The world don't care. The world don't know and the world don't care. But you know, God knows, and we know it of each other. We have to look at each other that way as God's royal family. Brothers and sisters, born again. So Peter said to him, well, we, we've left everything in verse 8. And we followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake. So he's saying, look, people said to leave all kinds of things for me. You're going to withhold something from Jesus? Well, I'm not giving you that. <laughs> I, I'm not giving you that. Well, then you should have been baptized. You shouldn't have been. Because at baptism, I ask everybody, even if it means you're going to have to give your life, are you going to? Because you have to give all. But that he will receive a hundred times as much now in this present age, houses, brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now notice it says there, along with persecutions. So yes, God is going to bless us, but with that, along comes persecutions. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 1. Brethren, if, if anyone, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. The response should be, oh no. A brother or sister is in danger. Uh, the response should be love. The response should be, oh no, I love my brother, I love my sister. And they're in a trespass. I need to something. Our first response shouldn't be, I will throw them, I got something on them, I'm gonna throw them into the bus. That's worldly. That's demonic. That's not godly. See, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone but not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught, the word is to share all things, good things with the one who teaches him. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for, whoever, for whatever man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Hallelujah. Let us not lose heart in doing good. Well, I'm tired. I, I mean, I'll do good for so far. I'll do good for maybe 10 years. I'll do good and not grow weary for 30 years. But I have my limits. Well, you might as well just get on out then because you ain't got no lasting power. You already have uh, 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 you are in, in your walk with God and you're on the, on the road to your destination, to heaven, to the kingdom of heaven, you already got yourself an off ramp. It's just a matter of wherever you're going to use it to turn around. So let us not lose heart in doing good for in due time we will reap what we do, we will reap if we do not grow weary. It's a matter of expectations. What do you expect? What do you expect? You think the world revolves around you? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't revolve around you. It's not about you. So many people in this age, they think everything is about them. They see everything 
from the prison of their own little self. It's ridiculous. Honestly, it's ridiculous. Get your eyes off self and get your eyes on Jesus. And remember what we just read. You don't live for yourself and you don't die for yourself. You were bought with a price. You belong to him. Your life is his. The life you live is his. And do what he says to do. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time will we reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's how we serve one another. And we'll conclude in Revelation chapter 21. And we'll have David come up and close us in prayer. Remember, every blessing brings a burden. They are related. No sacrifice, no reward, no pain, no gain, no labor, no baby. Children are a blessing. But anybody that's ever had one knows they're a burden too. <laughs> Lord, we know it, don't we, honey? We had five. <laughs> we got a couple just finding out about it, but uh, maybe Michael will make them a little t-shirt. This blessing is also a little burden. <laughs> the burden of a little blessing <laughs> for these little ones. Uh, yeah, uh, Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 5. So let's just always trust in the Lord. We have to trust in Him. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, first earth passed away. And there is no longer any sea. You see, God's going to, rem- I mean, you, if you think about why would God make a new heaven and a new earth? Well, you know, you just think about all the blood shed on this earth, all the wickedness that has happened, all the wicked places that they are where tragic things have happened, atrocities. I'm glad he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. I'm really happy about that. There'll be no reminders. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, this is a city where there's never been any death, a city where there's never been any, any, any child ever molested or you know, any slavery taking place, nothing. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And notice verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, no crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So they're gone. But now notice verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. All things new. I think that even includes our memory. I think that includes everything. All things, I believe, is all things. And he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the way that you love us. Thank you for choosing to bear the hurt and the pain, watching your son be so bitterly betrayed and mistreated and allowing him to shed his precious blood to cover our sins so that you could make us your own, bring us to yourself, give us a share in the joy of your presence, 
a brand new name nobody else knows, to know the joy of being close to you, to share in your glory, to be your children forever. And Lord, we know that when you wipe away our tears, that we haven't shed the tears that you've shed. It hurts us, the injustice and the pain in this world, but it doesn't hurt us like it hurts you. But you bore it because you know that the joy that's coming, you know it. And we so earnestly long for that day. And Father, thank you for being so patient and so merciful and forgiving us. Our sin is great before you, but your mercy is greater, your grace is greater, the gift you gave is greater, Jesus' blood is greater. Thank you, Father, thank you for that, so that we can know the love that you are and share it for all eternity. And we pray, Father, that you would transform our hearts, fill us with your mercy and with your grace, and let us always look at one another the way that you do and remember the great mercy that you've extended to us and that we only stand in that grace. It means everything to us. So, Father, we pray that you would help us to be that so that your glory would increase, so that your joy would be made full, so that your family will be complete in all eternity. And we know that you're going to do it. And we thank you for it. And now we ask that you would bless the fellowship in this meal. Father, bless those who worked hard in order to provide it. And Father, we pray that you would inspire the conversation and the fellowship, that that would be pleasing to you, that Jesus, as you walk among us, that you would find joy. So we give you thanks for all of these things, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.